I'm Philip. I'm from Vienna, a uh, city of fatty foods, um, classical architecture, and beautiful women. Um, but at least we won the Euro contest some, at some point, thanks to her. Um, yeah, so I'm with Elastic. Um, I'm part of the infrastructure team, so I'm doing lots of Jenkins builds, AWS, Ansible Chef, Puppet Scripts, all these things. And I'm also out at lots of conferences to talk about what we're doing. And today, I'm happy to talk more about full text search. Um, so, when I'm not out in the world like today, uh, back at home, I'm also running meetups about databases and academic papers, but we don't want to go into too much of the academic side today. So, who uses databases? I guess everybody, right? Who uses full text search? Okay, that's a lot fewer. Uh, let's see why, or what is the difference? Like, what is the difference between databases and full text search? And I'm always like to explain it like this. This half here is the database, whereas this is the full text search. Um, why? Because databases are very much black and white. You store data and you want to retrieve the results, and you just search for some specific result and you just have a match or you don't have a match. So you get exactly what you want. It's either black or white. Um, whereas full text search, um, it's not in color, so it's not really the, the real world, but it has more shades of gray, so you can see like finer details. It has, is much richer from the picture um, than the black and white version. Because here you don't care about stuff like singular or plural, you just search for something and you want to, to find like the concept. You probably don't even care about adjective and noun. You just think about the idea or the concept you want to find. Um, so let's dive into that. Um, I'm sure somebody in the audience will now say, um, but I can do stuff like this with my relational database, where I put a percentage sign at the beginning and at the end, and then I just match that specific part uh, in all my uh, fields I have, um, so in my, my text column. Um, is this a good idea? Probably not. Um, it will kind of uh, end up like this, uh, mainly because of two reasons. Um, the first one is performance. Um, relational databases, as many of you are probably aware, uh, store their indices in B trees, so it's a tree-like structure. Um, but the tree will only help you if whatever you're searching for starts um, with what the tree has. So if you have the wildcard at the beginning, the index doesn't help you at all. It's just like you will need to go through all your documents and scan all of them and search through all the strings. Um, so it works much like a phone book where you have last name, first name, and if you search by the beginning of the last name, everything is good. But if you search for a specific first name, the phone book doesn't help you or if you're just searching for a part of the last name, which doesn't need to be at the beginning, also the phone book doesn't help you at all. So this is why performance will suffer, and it will look something like this. The more documents you, or the, the more uh, rows you have, um, the longer the query will take, because you need to look at all the, the, the fields uh, you have. Whereas if you would use a proper B tree, um, it would be log, so at some point it would be more or less stable and uh, your search overhead does not increase anymore. And every now and then somebody will open up a ticket and say, well, this is slow, and then uh, Yoda says, um, it works kind of as expected, or as Yoda says, um, as expected works. Um, yeah. As you can see, I'm, I'm using Star Wars here as my examples. Um, unfortunately, I must confess, I, I do not know Game of Thrones, so I, I'm very bad at memes about that. Um, so you will need to stick to Star Wars with me here. Okay, the second thing you're missing out if you're using a relational database is stuff like fuzziness, synonyms, and scoring. So fuzziness is you have probably mistyped stuff a bit, um, but it's very similar, but without having the proper match, you still don't find anything. Stuff like synonyms is not really supported or not supported at all by relational databases or scoring where you have multiple matches, but they are of different quality and you actually want to find kind of the best one, whatever best defines. We, we will see what best is later on. Um, but all of this is not yeah, contained in a relational database because it has this very much black and white view. It, find something, it gives you all the stuff it finds, but it doesn't have these finer details of when you are looking for stuff. So, 
How does this work? Let's start off, we have a document and we want to store it for full text search. Um, whereas the relational databases have a very easy model for that. It's just like take the data, put it somewhere on the disk and then retrieve it later on. Storing in full text search normally means much more work. So this is then, we normally say to index data or putting it into an index. This is already the first confusion because in the relational databases, uh, the index is just a B tree or normally a B tree, um, which will help you to find stuff faster. Um, whereas in full text search, normally the index or to index means just storing data in the full text search engine. So I will just say indexing to store the data now. Don't be confused by that. First thing is normally you remove the formatting. If you have stuff like HTML tags in the text or any other formatting, you want to get rid of that because that's probably not what you're searching for. Next up is normally tokenization. Tokenization is you have a very long string or text or whatever, and you find the individual tokens. The tokens will be like the words. So normally what you will do is you split up by spaces or punctuation marks. This does not work in stuff like Japanese and Chinese, um, but let's focus on Western languages where we have spaces and punctuation marks and there it's good enough. So there, uh, tokenization is pretty easy and you can just work it through. Next thing is then you remove the stop words. Stop words are just little words that are very common, like is, a, and, if, not. These appear in nearly every text and they add pretty little meaning to your text and nobody is really searching for them, they would just blow up your index size, so you remove them, you just throw them out. And then there is stemming. Stemming tries to take a word and reduce it to the root of the word or the stem, which is pretty easy in languages like English or German, where it's normally you just have the ending that varies a bit uh, and the rest always stays the same. Um, I don't speak Ukrainian or Russian, but I have been told that this is not as easy in these languages because the variation is much greater um, and stuff gets harder. But we will get into that a little later. And then, after you've reduced the words to their stem, so kind of the, the thing or the concept, you can optionally put synonyms on them. So there might be different words for one thing and people might use these different words, but they still want to find the same thing and then you want to add your synonyms. So, since I'm from Elastic, let's use Elasticsearch. Let's see how that actually works. So, just for your understanding, um, Elasticsearch uses Apache Lucene, uh, kind of below the scene. Um, and Apache Lucene is that what we are talking about today. So Lucene is actually doing all these steps we've just described, like the stemming, the stop words, the synonyms, and all of that. Lucene is doing all this hard work on the full text search side, whereas Elasticsearch is more the shell around it. So Elasticsearch then does the distribution, the replication of the data. Um, it provides the REST interface, the query DSL, whereas Lucene is just like a library. And you use the library, and the library does all the full text search, the hard work below it. Um, tomorrow, I will give a talk about the distribution and how resiliency works in Elasticsearch. So today, we're kind of focusing more on the Lucene parts. I will use Elasticsearch query DSL, but whatever system uses Lucene in the, un in, in the underground or below the surface, the, the stuff will be totally applicable to that. And tomorrow, I'll talk about uh, Elasticsearch then. So, we're sticking to Star Wars. Um, what is the quote he's saying in that scene? Yeah, exactly. These are not the droids you're looking for. So our example will be these are not, and we have put an emphasis on not, um, the droids you are looking for. And now we want to analyze that with Elasticsearch. So the first thing is we strip out the HTML because that doesn't add any meaning in that example. It's like HTML is just dead weight. So we remove the HTML, and then we have the plain text, these are not the droids you're looking for. That was easy. Next up, we tokenize. We use, since it's plain English, we use the standard tokenizer, punctuation marks and spaces are all we need. And then we have, I've just made the space a little bigger and each one of them is now a token. And you can see the, the dot at the end has been removed, so it's just the tokens, the words, this is what remains. 
The next step is we just throw it through a lowercase filter because we don't care about uppercasing and lowercasing. Um, yeah, the change was very minor. These and yeah, just these changed. Uh, and then we move the stop words. Now here, much more is happening. So these are not the droids you're looking for. And then the stop words leave just droids you looking. Because everything else is a stop word and has been removed. And then we actually stem that down. So droids you looking becomes droid you look. That is kind of the word stem. So this is what remains after you've thrown it through the entire pipeline of Elasticsearch. So to actually try that out, Elasticsearch has, it's called underscore analyze. It's just an endpoint you can use. And there you can just throw your strings and see what's actually happening to them. And if you use this text, these are not the droids you're looking for. And we say, remove the HTML, uh, use the standard tokenizer, lowercase it, remove the stop words, use the snowball stemming. Um, we can actually try it out just to show you. Um, so I'm using the, is that big enough for everybody to see? Works, okay. Um, I'm using, uh, that is version five already, and the visualization here, that is Kibana. There's just the window into your data. Um, if you used to Kibana, yours might look different, but this is the release candidate of the upcoming version, which will be released pretty soon. I will just use that to interact with it. We could just use plain curl, but this is much nicer. Like in curl, you would write for the same command. In curl, you would write curl uh, x get local host 9200. And this is exactly the same as this. This is just nicer syntax we provide. It's called console. Previously, it was called sense. And so we can just run these commands. So we are working with the, la the latest release candidate. I think it only came out on Monday um, of Elasticsearch. And then we have our example here. So our text is, these are not the droids you're looking for. We throw it against the underscore analyze endpoint. And this is the pipeline we actually define it should run through. And if we run that, it will give me something like that. So you have droid, you look. That is what I've shown you before. And you can also see there is stuff like the position. The position will then be relevant if you actually search for stuff like phrases where you say, this word must appear, and right after it, this other word needs to appear. So there, the position is relevant. So you can see we have filtered out 0 to 3, and we have 4, 5, and 7. So if you search for droid u, which would be a very weird phrase, but in case you would search for that, you would find that. But if you search for u look, that wouldn't match because there is number six missing, so this is not an exact phrase, there is something in between. And that is basically all there is to that. So, let's try some Russian. So I don't speak Russian, but I was told this is kind of the same phrase. I is it okay? Um, because for me, it, yeah, it's just science. Um, and we can actually, we can actually run that through Elasticsearch as well. Um, the only difference is we use the, the same analyze. We, we use the same um, jar filter, tokenizers, and filters. We just tell it the analyzer I want to. So this is Russian. I need to tell. Elasticsearch does not um, like guess the language or anything. Um, you will need to figure that out yourself. It will just you tell it this is now Russian, for example, and then it will um, analyze Russian. So I have my string here. So if I run that, it stems it down to, yeah. Unfortunately, I cannot pronounce it, but um, I can show you kind of the, the, the shorthand version, which um, looks like this. So this is the stemmed version. And if my information was correct, <clears throat> the not is also missing in this text, right? Which says these are kind of these are the droids you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, that, that is the stemming. That is the point of the stemming to remove the word ending and just find a generic form you can actually search for. Um, so, yeah, for us, for everything non-English, you will need to define the language, for example, for Russian or for German, you do the same. If you, by the way, use the wrong um, language analyzer, stuff will totally not work. So, for example, if you have a German text and you use the English analyzer, uh, the stemming and the stop words 
just don't do anything uh, because they don't match and you will just get the original string basically. Obvious question next. Um, yeah, that, that was how we did it. Um, Ukrainian. Um, there is a plugin that was available for version one and two. And the kind, I assume it's a guy or a girl, I don't know, um, who, who contributed that, um, then said, hey, um, we could put that into Apache Lucene, so everybody can, could contribute from that, or can actually benefit from that, and you don't need to install that plugin. So it was added in Lucene 6.2, which is the current version. Um, maybe you saw it in, in my um, get command I showed at the beginning. It was is Elasticsearch 5.0, but the Lucene version is 6.2 now already. But that has only come out like less than a month ago, I think. And unfortunately, we, we didn't yet get around to expose the, the analyzer for Ukrainian. So it is kind of in Lucene there, but it, the interface has not been extended in Elasticsearch. So there is a ticket. If, if you're desperately waiting for support uh, in Elasticsearch, this is the ticket where you can comment and which you can watch. Um, I assume we will add it in Elasticsearch 5.1, which yeah will probably come in a few months or so. Let's see. Uh, and then Ukrainian support will be properly added. Yes. How many languages are supported out of the box? Like, a lot. <laughs> um, so, so for, we can totally look that up in the documentation afterwards. I would guess it's 20 or 30 or something. So like, the Western European languages are also supported. Um, for example, yesterday I was in the Czech Republic and Czech is supported. I think the, the small ones like Slovenian and Slovakian, they are not yet supported and it's not yet in Lucene, but it's kind of on the to-do list. But again, it will take time because somebody will need to actually implement that. Then it will need to go into a Lucene release and only when, once there is a Lucene release, we include that in Elasticsearch. We need to wrap it properly and only then will it be available. So. Russian is supported, the kind of the big Western languages, Chinese, Japanese, and stuff like that is also supported. Um, but like if you have very small languages, I mean, Ukrainian is not small, but obviously there was not the high demand, but yeah, it will come soon. Um, but for small languages, you might be out of luck. But you could still do um, like build custom solutions with Huntspell. When there is a dictionary for your language, you could still kind of create um, your own workarounds and solutions. Okay, so um, I'm switching back to English so I can kind of understand what's going on as well. Um, so assume we have the string Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. What do you guess is the end result when I throw that through the analyze in Elasticsearch? And actually, we can just try it out. So it's yeah. So this is my string, Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. If I run it through the standard pipeline, any guesses what will remain? Yeah, that, that's pretty good. So Obi-Wan is just split up, the, the dash is just removed, so we have Obi-Wan, never told. Um, since this is not a dictionary, the stemming doesn't, so you would need a dictionary to actually move the told to tell, because there is no specific rule for that. So told stays told. Um, you, what happened, your father. And what, what I find interesting, for example, is that uh, you and your, actually, these are kept, and these actually make a difference there. OK. So any guesses what this will give you? No, I am your father. Your father? Yeah, uh, unfortunately it's a bit tricky. It leaves, I am your father. Just the no is removed. Yep, you, you always guess wrong, unfortunately. Um, that's, that, that's the way it works. Um, so I think I have that in my slides. Yes. Um, since I mainly know Western European languages, my examples are always that. There are then, the general concept I guess is clear. Uh, what happens to specific languages? Like, there's always this case. Like, some stuff is language specific. Like, the apostrophe s in English is like the possessive has or is. So that is normally just stripped away. 
In French, for example, you would remove stuff from the beginning, where you have Eglise, which is church, if my French still serves me, uh, and the accent, um, they are just removed. So you can not only remove the stemming, does not mean it has to be at the end, it can only be at the beginning, if you have the right rules. Or for example, in, jo in German, the umlauts, the, the dots from the umlauts are just removed, and this S is just removed to, or moved to a double S. So this is like language specific rules. And this will then of obviously totally depend on what language you have and need to support. Um, and you can then find the rules and kind of get the feeling how it works under the hood. And what is also nice is, I have no idea if this works in Russian, unfortunately, or Ukrainian. Uh, I assume not, but there is a phonetic token filter. Um, so if you have Joe blocks and people do not know how to actually spell that, um, it just makes, Joe could also be J, just from the, the spelling, because it kind of sounds similar. And all of this would then be indexed, and all of these terms could then be found. But this is only a plugin, this is not available by default. But if you have absolutely no idea how to spell stuff, and you just have like the pronunciation in your head, uh, with the right plugin, that can be a, um, kind of, yeah, all these pronunciations can be found as well and then stored for you. Okay, so now to do it properly in Elasticsearch because the un underscore analyze is just like playing around with strings. We will use an actual example now. Um, an index is like a database in the relational world. A type is often compared in Elasticsearch to a table, but that is actually a very bad comparison. Um, a type is kind of, think of it as like an enumeration. So you have different kinds of documents in one index and yeah, it's just like dif different types, but it's just all in the same data structure. And the mapping is what the schema would be in the relational world. I know it's kind of common knowledge, the relational world, uh, the NoSQL world does not have schemas, it's schema-less, but at least for Elasticsearch, that is not true. You do not need to specify your mapping upfront. It's called dynamic mapping then, but then the mapping is inferred from the very first document you insert. And if that first document is not like the other documents, stuff will fail. And at least for production, you do not want to rely on the dynamic mapping, but you want to specify that um, explicitly. For example, if you have, in the first document you insert, you have something as a string, and, oh no, let's, let's take an example. The first document has something that is a floating value, and then you try to insert a document where in that field name there is a string, it will obviously fail because it has typed it to a floating value down. Um, so this is just like the index, it's not just two index to store, but it's like also the, the thing where you store your data. Um, the type and the mapping, and now we'll just see, it's just a quick example how this actually looks like. Um, this is another common question, um, like the English crowds don't care so much about that, but international crowds always care like, how do I store uh, multiple languages if not everything is Ukrainian, for example, but you have mix of Russian, Ukrainian. Um, one thing is you create just one index, kind of one database for each language, and then they're cleanly separated the different languages. Um, kind of the obvious solution is what many people would think about is like, hey, I could just use the types because they're just like this enumeration and I have my enumeration of Russian and Ukrainian, but that is not a good idea because it will normally break your query statistics because in one field name, it will kind of count like how many times the term occurs and you have these statistics on how, what data you have in your index and that does not work if you have multiple languages. So the type is not a good approach. What you could do instead is uh, multiple languages or multiple fields for each language. So the first one would be use an index where you have, I don't know, quotes uh, dash Romanian, uh, quotes uh, Russian, uh, quotes uh, Ukrainian. So you have two indexes for that. Or you have fields, you have a field like um, if you analyze emails, you could have like subject and body, and you would have subject um, dash Russian and subject dash Ukrainian, for example. So you have just different field names for different languages. So you don't have interference between the different fields. Okay, now I'm creating my mapping, my schema. So my index is called Star Wars. 
which is kind of the obvious choice. And the first thing I'm defining here is I'm just setting up synonyms. I'm saying uh, wherever there is droid, I also want to be able to search that with the term machine. Wherever there is father, I want to be able to search that with dad, for example. So these are just the synonyms. So these are the words that appear in my documents. And these are the synonyms I want people to be able to search as well. Then I'm just defining, or here I have stored this under my synonym filter. Next up, I'm just running through my entire pipeline. And at the very end, this is new, my synonym filter from the previous slide, I'm adding that here as well. The whole thing is stored as my analyzer. All of that, these are three slides which are just one big JSON blob, uh, but I've split it up over three slides to make it easier to show. Uh, and now I'm saying I have, in my index, Star Wars, I have a type, quotes, and my field is called quote, and is of the type text, and that is analyzed with my analyzer that I have defined the pre two previous slides. So this is just like one single field, but I have now mapped synonyms, all the pipelines for the analyzation and indexing together, and this is how I can actually store it. Okay, so we can try that out, actually. So this is just the whole blob I've shown you now, with the mapping at the end. If I run that, it will tell me, okay, I have created that index for you with that mapping. Um, downside is, in Elasticsearch, you cannot change the mapping once you have created it. You can add new fields. But if you want to change the mapping of an existing document, you will need to re-index your data. But that is kind of part of life in Elasticsearch. So I think our support always says there, there's always three things that you can expect from Elasticsearch. The first is one, there will be new features, um, stuff will improve, and you will need to re-index your data. That is kind of a given. And those who have already worked with Elasticsearch will probably know that, yes, at some point you will need to re-index your data. Uh, but there is now the re-index API, so it's probably a li little bit less painful than it was previously. Okay, so I've created my mapping. It looks pretty easy. Uh, index is Star Wars, um, type is quotes, field is quote, and yeah, it's text and uses my analyzer. Uh, and actually to find that how these, the set, the analyzer is defined, I, I run underscore settings, and you can see this is just what I've set up previously. Yes, and now I can insert data. So I'm just using the three quotes we had used before, and I'm just inserting them now for real. So I'm just putting the JSON documents into Star Wars quotes, and I just give it a, an ID one, two, three. Uh, you could have Elasticsearch generated for you, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so I have inserted that, and actually what I want to do now is I want to show all the all the documents I've inserted, which should be, I want to search Star Wars, I want to write a query, and the query I want to do is a, a match all. Ah, uh, sorry. Actually, I want to query data, uh, I want to search data, that would help. So, you can see, in my Star Wars index, uh, I have three documents in total, and yeah, they are in random order, so Star Wars with ID 2, 1, and 3, all my three quotes are in my index now. Okay, so if I search for Droid now, it's, yeah, we won't go into too much of the syntax details, it doesn't matter that much, but what I have is I want to have a query that matches on the field quote and has droid in it. We run that, it tells you, okay, there is one hit, um, and this is the document where you have found it. And that looks kind of obvious. Um, we'll get into the score a little later on because that is actually what makes also one of the big differences between a relational database and full text search where there is this quality aspect of data you can find. Okay, other than that, what if I want to find that? Did I have that in my data set? No, but I have defined the uh, synonym. So if I find search for that, if I search that, it will even find, no, I am your father, and 
Obi-Wan never told me what happened to your father, so it will find those. So it will just happen in the background that the synonyms are actually done and covered. What if I don't know how to spell something? So in my simple text, it was pretty hard to find a word I, I couldn't spell correctly, but assume you don't know how to spell Obi-Wan and you spell it one with like that. If you run that, I have defined the fuzziness as auto. It will still find your Obi-Wan um, because of the fuzziness, even though it doesn't match. Um, the fuzziness is basically just the Levenstein distance. So you could define a Levenstein distance with one, two, three, whatever, and that number is, one means there is one letter too much, one letter too little, or one letter different which matches in that case. Or you just set it to auto, and then it will find a sensible um, value for that and display that for you. So I think we've done most of that. Oh, yeah. I've kind of skipped that. So when, you, when we have s inserted those three documents, actually what Elasticsearch in the background so stores, or actually Lucene stores, is something like this. So you have the stemmed words. These are all the stemmed words you have extracted. And then it knows, OK, this word um, is contained in the document with the ID 1. For example, draw it, look, and you is contained. Each of these words is contained one time in these documents. And this is then actually the position. And I'm, I've just extracted the position so I can uh, do the, the phrase search later on. And it will just, for every word you have, it will create that list and say, it is contained in that document or it is not contained in that document. Um, what actually will happen behind the scenes, it, I think the data structure is actually a linked list, so you don't have these zero values and stuff like that. Um, so it, it doesn't waste as much space um, as you might think from that here. OK, so we have done the searching. Um, yeah, I will post the slides afterwards so you have the complete examples. We've done all of that. Um, we've done the fuzziness. Yeah, for the fuzziness, of course you could do stuff like that in a relational database. But A, it won't be fast, and B, as soon as the word is longer than three characters, um, this will not get any prettier. Like, you probably don't want to do that. Okay, stuff you can do as well is you can highlight. For example, if you say, I'm searching for father, and I want to have HTML, I can just say the, the tags before the, ta the hit and after the hit. And it's on the field quote. And it would then just give me the source. This is the original document. And the highlights, this is where I have inserted my tags, whatever tag I would want to have here. So you can simply throw that out to your web interface and have actually highlighted where your match was. So this is pretty convenient. Um, this will fail with that, for example. That would be found, but there would not be nothing to highlight because the term actually doesn't appear. So, so it wouldn't then match on, um, so it wouldn't highlight farther if you searched for that now. OK, other stuff you can do. Um, suggestions. Um, these will need a change to the mapping, and the mapping will become even bigger, so I'm kind of skipping that. The idea of map uh, suggestions is you search for something, you don't really find anything, but you can optionally find a suggestion like, did you mean this, what you can prop commonly see on search engines, um, where you have the query, and you can define a query and a suggestion, and the suggestion will give you like um, what else you could use. And you can do that in a single query. So you can either call suggestions explicitly, or you can call um, it on search. So it will first search. If the search doesn't give you any result, it will give you a suggestion instead. So it's just one trip to Elasticsearch, and then you will have, hopefully, some meaningful result. And what can also be very handy is partial results. So if you have no idea what you're searching for and you have just like a little piece of a word. Um, so if you have, like in German, um, in German we, we don't have different words, but we just combine words together. So they can get really, really long. It's just like if you have multiple nouns, they're just joined together. There are no spaces between them. They're just one big word. And then just finding like one little piece uh, in a very long word does not work because uh, it cannot be tokenized because there are no spaces. Um, so we need partial matches for that, for example. 
Um, and what is common is so-called engrams. One specific implementation that is widely used is trigrams. You just take a word and group it into three character groups. And then, for example, if you would analyze the word father, you would get these four three-letter combinations. And then you would store all of them. And then you could search, like, which my search term, you will group that into three-letter groups as well. And with which word does it have the most matches on these groups of three? That is um, what you can do with trigrams. But obviously, this will use way more disk space and blow up your indexes than just storing the plain words. OK. And now we can go to the scoring, because that is kind of the magic that is um, also in full text search. Um, the general idea is term frequency, inverse document frequency, in short, TF-IDF. Um, all of the stuff I'm now saying is just if you search for a single term. So what this does is, yeah, BM25 is kind of the same thing with slightly different parameters, and it will be the default in Elasticsearch 5.0, but we'll just talk about and think about uh, TF-IDF because it's the same thing and th the same concepts still apply. So the first thing is the term frequency. Um, it's the square root of the frequency of a term in a document, which basically means I have a document and the term I'm searching for appears three times in that document, in another document, uh, in which the term appears a single time. Where the, the term appears three times, that document is more relevant than the, the document where my term appears a single time. So term frequency, the more often that my search term appears in a document, the more relevant that document will be. That's kind of obvious. Um, looks like this, so the formula has changed li slightly in BM25, like TFIDF is growing um, stronger. The, the more often the word appears, um, the higher the, the value or the, the weight of, of that word or document will be, whereas BM25 is flattening that out a little bit. But the general approach is still the same. If it appears once, um, yeah, it is not as important. If it appears five times, it is way more important, the document. Next, the inverse document frequency. That is kind of if you have a word that appears very often and another word that appears very rarely, the word that appears rarely is probably more relevant. So if you have one word that is nearly all the documents, if you hit that word, it's not so special because it's contained in nearly all the documents. Whereas if you have a word that only appears in very, very few documents, that word will carry a lot of weight. And the idea here is, how often does the, doc, uh, the term appear in my entire document body? The more often it appears, the less relevant it will be. Um, the less often it appears, the more relevant my term will be. And then there is the field length norm, which is just the idea like if you have a very short field and your term appears in it, it is more relevant than if you have a very long field and your term appears there. Um, think of it if you have, for example, the title of a document. If, the, if your search term appears in the title, that is relevant. If your search term just appears in the body and it's very long, it's not as relevant. So it's just one divided by the square root of the number of terms in one document. Okay. And then you can put all of that together and you can actually boost fields where you say if stuff appears in that field it is more important or less important. But yeah, looks complicated, is complicated. Um, the three concepts we've touched on, these are the most important ones. So you can actually let yourself explain why you get the results uh, you get. So if you have your search for father, it will, and you have the uh, question mark explain attached to it, it will actually tell you, okay, the total score was 0 0.41 something, and like the document frequency contributed that part to it, then there was uh, the term frequency norm um, that contributed that part to it. So here, these are the different pieces which add up to the calculation and the final number you will get. So this is how you can see how stuff works. So for example, if I have the string, I am your father, it has that value. And if Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father, so these are already the stem words, um, this is a lower score. Any ideas why this is rated higher than this? Or what is the difference between the two? Exactly. Both of them contain father once, 
So that doesn't make a difference. We are searching for father, so it's everywhere the same. But the first one is shorter, so this is more relevant than the second one exactly. Um, so all of that, what I said, was just for a single term so far. Once you have two terms or more, uh, it's, we use the vector space model, which sounds very fancy, and it is also very nice to explain. Um, so what you do is you search for each term, you vectorize it, you calculate the vector for that term, and then you calculate the angle to the perfect match. So assume we are searching for your and Obi. Uh, we assume that your will appear very often and Obi will appear very rarely in your documents in comparison. So I'm assigning to them arbitrary values. So for example, your, if you search for your, it would have the weight of one, whereas Obi, which appears less often, has the weight of five. The perfect match, a document containing both documents, would be, well, that angle here. Now, what is more relevant, a document just containing your or a document just containing Obi? So a document just containing your would be this one, or a document just containing Obi would be that one. And then you can calculate the angle. And this angle is much smaller than this angle. So the perfect match is your Obi, the second most relevant thing would be OB, and only the third most relevant would be your then. So this is the vector space model, which is very nice to explain in a two-dimensional space. If you have more dimensions, it gets harder, but just think of it in the two-dimensional space. Okay, to conclude, there are multiple steps we need to run through um, for actually indexing data to have it be able to full text search it efficiently. Um, we have the scoring features for single terms. Term frequency, the more often a term appears in a document, the more relevant. Inverse document frequency, common terms are less relevant than very rare terms. And the field length norm, short fields carry more relevancy. And if you're in, the mo in searching for more than one term, uh, you're in a vector space model, think of it the two dimensions where you have the optimal match, and then you can calculate the angle between the relevancy of the other terms and see how relevant those are. That's basically it. Um, I have loads of stickers over there. Grab some stickers. Um, other than that, any questions? I think we have still a few minutes left. Yes, five minutes or so. Any questions? Uh, thank you for your uh, lecture. I have a question. Uh, so uh, we use Elasticsearch in our production, and we have a lot of documents with uh, properties on different languages. And uh, so the problem we are facing now, uh, we don't know which language user was the, the, the text that the user searched. We don't know, for, for instance, uh, what language was it. So we, we search on all languages, but uh, which analyzer should we use? <laughs> Any hints to how 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 it better to guess it? Maybe maybe you know something. About um, things. Yeah. So this is nothing Elasticsearch itself really does. Um, I've seen people do it like they have um, they just have like common words. So for example, I don't know. There there's like very, if if you if you just search for three terms. That, that won't work, but I've seen it for, if people analyze a text and don't know what language it is, they will just search for like specific words which are common in that language. Other than that, for if a user just searches for three terms, that won't really work. I mean, you can always use the brute force approach um, and just try it out over everything, but if a user then gets the wrong language, for whatever reason that matches best, uh, he probably won't be happy. Um, I mean, there... Yeah, of course, but uh, like the uh, identifying the language is nothing Elasticsearch does. Maybe you would need to throw it through a natural language processor, um, which is probably too heavy. And also, if a user just adds three words, it's probably also not that good. Um, but like identifying the language is a problem in itself, and that is not what Elasticsearch generally tackles. Oh, I, I didn't really explain that, but like. Elasticsearch is not doing natural language processing. So it's just like it finds these tokens, and each word is just treated independently. And if there is no droid or there is droid, 
Elasticsearch doesn't know about the concept. It's just looking at words independently. Um, what is also common, what I've seen, is that some languages that are very hard to stem is that people actually store or analyze the text multiple times. Um, so they have, like, once they just lowercase it and then just store the plain thing. Um, once they uh, build the trigrams, for example, and then they analyze it with the proc per language analyzer. And then they search over all of that just to find good matches. Because languages that are hard to stem uh, often don't give you really good results otherwise. Um, but if you do not know what your input language is, that will be hard. Then, yeah, of course, you can go for trigrams. But you, do, you already do that? Yeah. Of course, it doesn't solve your problems. Um, if you know what language the input is, it would be much easier. But this is nothing Elasticsearch itself really tackles. Like, it, it's not, it's not really or it doesn't really understand the language. Also, just from three terms, it's very hard to in inferior the language, I guess. So, yeah. 